Welcome. Thank you for your interest in online education at Berkeley. I'm Diana Wu. I'm the Dean of UC Berkeley Extension. I'm also the Executive Director of the Berkeley Resource Center for Online Education, which is a service unit. There's over 30 of us now who um, service the entire campus, whoever's interested, faculty or departments interested in providing hybrid or online education. I am going to take full credit for putting together a fantastic panel of speakers today. And um, I'm actually going to let them introduce themselves in the interest of time, because we're starting a little bit late. So uh, I hope uh, your, my panelists will forgive me for that. I'm going to dive into the introduction. So one thing that, that we started with was a very clear assumption that online education covers a spectrum of activities. It's not one thing. The first thing is uh, we wanted to provide access, open access, free access, uh, very much aligned with our mission as a public university and a public research university. Individual credit courses and certificate programs blended courses, you'll be hearing quite a bit about that today, and finally degree programs. So I made the assumption that um, most of you may, I didn't ask you this, I'm wondering if you're in, more interested in undergraduate education versus graduate education. We can talk a little bit about both. So open access, if you go to webcast.berkeley.edu, or if you go to, um, is it Berkeley X, Armando, for the MOOCs? Yep. Um, those, you'll find free classes available that are online. These are not for credit because they're not instructor-led, but on webcast you'll find a, a great, actually a big number of YouTube lectures from Berkeley faculty that are just free, you know, for, for viewing. MOOCs, Armando is going to talk about, that actually is more interactive and um, contains auto assessments, auto grading. Uh, these are not free to produce, so even though they're free for the public, they actually cost, right now, our estimate is $50,000 to $100,000 to produce. So the university has made a commitment to produce MOOCs uh, for the public good. There's also some revenue generation for those of you who are interested um, because students have the option. They could pay a little bit of money, not very much, to earn a, what's called a verified certificate program so that we can tell that the student actually took the test, passed the test. Employers may care if you took Armando's class in software design and you did well in it. Uh, it could be a, used as a credential. That's just gratuitous, gratuitous shot of UC Berkeley, it's beautiful. I was walking um, on campus the other day. There were, I just happened to be behind two, I think there were undergraduate students, and one was saying to the other, you know, this whole thing, this, all, this, all this fuss and noise about online education, well, it's all great, but it doesn't replace this. And she, just, she stopped walking and she looked at the sky, and she just doesn't replace this, which is, you know, kind of the campus atmosphere and environment. This is just a screenshot of um, a map that, I don't know if you can see it very well. This is the college writing um, MOOC class. And it had, I, I believe, over 50,000 enrollments when it first opened. And this is, these are students from all over the world. So the red zones are the, where the highest enrollments are coming from. And I just thought it was kind of a, a cool snapshot of the reach of a MOOC course. A MOOC is a massive open online course, by the way. The second category on our online spectrum is uh, individual courses and certificate programs. So UC Extension, in, in this case, we have the most classes by far currently at Berkeley. We have about 170 courses for credit. And um, uh, those students can take for either uh, credit, they can use it potentially to transfer to their home degree program, they can use it for career enhancement, etc. cetera. Uh, and Summer Sessions offers, I believe, around 10 courses right now. Uh, mostly it's UC Berkeley students taking those classes for credit to transfer to their Berkeley degree. 
There's also executive education that's offered online now. And you see system-wide, the Office of the President is offering courses for undergraduate credit. These are some of the reasons um, that folks are interested in seeing us offer online courses. <coughs> Has to do with throughput, productivity. Throughput meaning students have an opportunity to take courses and it, it helps them um, potentially graduate a little earlier than they might have if they, for example, might not be able to get into a class on campus that they want to take. So I know it's hard to remember numbers, but keep these numbers in mind because we're going to be talking about MOOCs in a moment. This sounds impressive. Since 2004, we've educated more than 80,000 students online. And um, 170 options, I think those are the number of courses. This is just a quick snapshot of a professor. This is Cameron Anderson, who teaches power and politics at the Haas School of Business. He did something really cool, which was he wanted, he wanted to, to push the boundaries of technology because he wanted to teach his class live uh, with, I believe, he had between 40 and 50 students in his classroom, and he's this really cool technology so that he could interact, he could pull up a student when the student wanted to talk, so this, you could see the student, uh, and he could see the class, you know, at the same time. So, one of the wonders of modern technology. Blended courses was a combination of classroom and online. Again, it gives us an opportunity to increase enrollment. Uh, provides much more flexibility. It actually enhances the campus experience. These are the degree programs, the online degree programs. Berkeley's relatively new to this. We've been cautious. There's huge concern about uh, maintaining the quality of the Berkeley degree, maintaining the quality of the students who are admitted to graduate programs at Berkeley. So right now we have three. We have the Masters of Advanced Study in Integrated Circuits, that's out of the College of Engineering. Masters of Information and Data Sciences, out of the School of Information. Masters of Public Health is out of the School of Public Health, and more to come. So these departments usually have um, very clear, compelling reasons for why they want to offer online degrees. A lot of it has to do with access. Some of these departments are quite small, they're only able to accept and it varies, you know, 20 students, 30 students into a master's degree program. It's extraordinarily competitive to get into a Berkeley graduate degree. And they're turning away, they fully acknowledge that they're turning away outstanding students who they're not able to accommodate in their graduate degree program by offering the degree online without uh, reducing the quality of the, not reducing, no, without um, compromising on the quality of the type of student that, that Berkeley is accepting, we're able to accept more of those students and accommodate them. We're also able to accommodate students who, again, are from other countries and for cost, um, maybe they have a job. For other factors, they're not able to come to Berkeley and enroll in a full-time degree program. The online degree program is an outstanding option because they're able to do that. So one thing I didn't mention, which is very important, which is, which is the reasons that Berkeley got into online education. So keep in mind, UC Extension, very clear mission. We've been doing online education for years. When the main campus started getting interested in online education, we thought long and hard about why are we doing this? Should we be doing this? What's it going to look like when we do do this? And how do we support it? Four very important reasons tied into Berkeley's mission. One is access and es excellence. Are we able to provide more access to students? Are we able to maintain and continue to improve upon our excellence as an institution? Secondly, is anything that we do online, whether hybrid, blended, or anything else, going to improve our ability to teach and for students to learn? So improving teaching and learning. Third, experimentation. Berkeley's all about experimentation and innovation. Fourth, research. We want to learn. We want to learn. We want to learn from what we do, from how we teach, from the students who we teach. We want to feed that, that back into, even if it's the classroom setting, what can we learn to improve our teaching? So 
I probably took too much time already. I'm going to end there. I'm going to hand it off to um, our panelists. I'm going to leave you with this image of Albert Einstein. Um, Except not for very long because I'm about to switch it. He's off. about to switch it. <laughs> I never sit and talk to people, so this is weird. Uh, so my name is Armando Fox. Uh, I work with Diana and with many faculty on campus. And one way to think about it is if you've heard of the nonprofit edX, which was originally started by MIT and Harvard a couple of years ago, Berkeley was sort of the, the launch partner when edX really came out and said, we're going to be the nonprofit way that world-class education materials are available freely to students around the world. So I uh, have had a lot to do with helping get that relationship off the ground and helping to run it. Uh, and that's the connection through which Berkeley is offering some of its courses as MOOCs or massive open online courses. But rather than talk about those and bore you with PowerPoint, uh, I think it helps a lot more to tell it as a story from the point of view of students who are taking one of my campus courses that is the basis of a MOOC. So if you'll bear with me and watch for a couple of minutes, what I'd like to do is connect the things we do in classrooms at Berkeley and what makes them unique with the way that MOOCs and other online education vehicles can reinforce that as opposed to, I think, what many of you may have read in the media that uh, schools everywhere are now conspiring to replace what they're doing and sit students in front of computers. So if I can get this to work. I didn't understand for a long time open source. You're going to like work on this project and then just give it away? Like I don't understand. Now I get it because you'll have one piece of an idea but you don't have time or you don't have the know-how to do all of it. Well, other people do and they can just like work on the little piece that they like. And that's fun. It's this way to like create something bigger. That's so exciting. That's a community that I want to be a part of. The class I'm teaching here that makes the heaviest use of GitHub is the software engineering course. And one of the big topics that we focus on in the class is how you build interesting software as part of a small team. Our final project for the course is a group project where there's six of us per group. Sometimes we'll be working in the same room together. Sometimes we'll be working at the same time but in different locations. It's just a way to get rid of this geographical coincidence that we don't live in the same place. It's not really important to the work that we're doing, so why should it define the way that we have to work together? We actually went around and asked Google, Amazon, eBay, Facebook, Microsoft, Twitter, you name it. What are the skills that you're looking for in competitive hires? One of the biggest things they said was learning to work in teams and learning to work with an external customer. We really reinvented the course largely along the lines of what they said, where students are working with a real external customer, typically a nonprofit. You're working on a group project for a client, and so you're really in a real world situation. It's really different and a unique experience to have that in school. It's one thing to do well in an interview, and it's a whole different thing to actually have code that works. So that's one thing I appreciate about this class in particular, is that the project that we're working on has to be open source. And so I finally have stuff on my GitHub repo that I've written that people can see. There's a big difference between reading a textbook and looking at the code versus a bunch of people actually able to learn by doing. I think that's the reason it's a game changer. Those are the best production values you'll probably ever see that has anything connected to my name on it. But now that you've absorbed what a couple of students had to say about the experience they're having in my on-campus course, let me just back that up with a short minute and a half testimonial from an actual happy customer, one of those nonprofit clients you heard from, and then I want to connect it to the agenda for online education. So thanks for bearing with me. That was the beauty of it. Um, they contacted us and arranged to meet with us every week. Um, sometimes we met weekly, sometimes it was every two weeks, um, but never for more than 20 minutes probably. Yes. It didn't take a lot of time for us, but trying to convey to them the rules 
that we have to go by for a vacation. We showed them what we did, and then we showed them the rules and gave them a copy of the rules. It was so yeah. smooth. Yeah. So, they came uh, back with ideas that we couldn't have uh, put forward and uh, brought into this institution. Sounds like you got a lot of opportunities to give feedback on what they were doing and, and that they tried to incorporate your suggestions. And they easily fixed any they concerns. They did. It yes. was amazing. So now with this prototype in place, is there a plan to use this and hope things get better? Correct, yes. So our vacations are due February 1st of each year. Um, and so we start usually in January. And that's we're going to start using it. Laura and I, we're both on the fifth floor, we'll end up trialing this um, this year, and if, if it's successful for us, it'll probably spread through other units in the hospital. Well, that's great. Okay. Thank you very much for your time, and also for working with our students. Thank it was you. great. It was a pleasure. <laughs> So, by the way, nurse vacation scheduling doesn't sound like it should be complicated, but as it turns out, because of seniority, union rules, and regulations about how much coverage there has to be on holidays and stuff, it's actually quite difficult. Um, and they're using this software now. This is written by students in one of our courses. So why am I telling you this stuff when we've been talking about these large-scale courses? We've seen uh, a big chunk of the course that has been described is also offered for free on edX. In fact, there's a little stack of cards here and on the literature table if you or someone you know wants to sign up for it. The next offering is starting in a week. Uh, typically, we'll get tens of thousands of people signing up. As soon as we ask someone to do work, like watching a video, we lose half of them. As long as we ask them to hand in a homework assignment and they are tough assignments, we lose half of them again. Uh, and around 7 to 10 percent of them come out the other end. Now, people have wrung their hands about uh, if we had a 90 percent dropout rate in a campus class, we'd be horrified, which is true. But think about it. These classes cost nothing, offer no credit. There's no penalty to dropping out. Some people get busy with real life. They have to come back later on. Some people only need to finish certain kinds of material. So I don't think it's fair to make those comparisons. I think a better thing to think about is the people who get to the end really appreciated the opportunity. They volunteer to help us run the class in the future, which is one reason that we can keep these free. And even with that dropout rate, so to speak, we're still getting a couple of thousand students through the class every time. If you look at when I teach this class on campus, we get maybe a couple of hundred students per semester. We're getting thousands of students a year who are using our materials, and they come from over 100 countries. They're very well educated, and we're getting a lot of great feedback about it. So how does this tie to what Berkeley uh, is already doing on campus? Why is this a great opportunity for us? Diana briefly alluded to the answer in the beginning of her slides, which is that one of the terms Berkeley takes credit for coming up with is the term SPOC for small private online course. A SPOC is what happens when you take the materials that were created for a MOOC, as my colleague Professor Dave Patterson and I did in this case, and you give a private copy of those materials to professors in classrooms. We have a dozen professors at other campuses besides Berkeley who are doing this as well. That means that they can run a blended course by deciding which of our materials they want to use, which materials to create themselves, and they can take advantage of the thousand hours or more that we and our teaching staff put into creating sophisticated automatic graders for programming assignments that are actually allowing our students to get better feedback now than they were when TAs had to grade each one by hand. So as a result of that, this is a course on campus that used to have waiting lists that were over 100 students long. We've been able to multiply by four the number of students we can accommodate in the campus course because of the materials and the effort that we created to make available as a free MOOC for everybody. Because we have these automatic graders, we haven't replaced our TAs. On the contrary, our TAs are better than they have ever been because they're now spending 100% of their time not grading papers and grading programming assignments, but actually working with students on the projects like the one that you saw featured. If we're not for that degree of automation, there's no way that the student projects could become as strong as they've become. And we now have nonprofit customers who are returning year after year to get the piece of software built by last year's students improved and modified by this year's students. And if you, in case you're wondering whether increasing the size of the course has affected quality, uh, what I've graphed here, the green line shows the enrollment in our course. You can see it started uh, about three years ago as an experimental course with uh, only about 50 people. And it's gone up to, uh, it was 165 in fall of 2012. The most recent number is not on here. We had 235 students last semester. But the blue and red lines are the interesting ones. Those are the students' ratings of how effective the course are, the course and the professor are. And the maximum you can get is seven. Uh, that puts you on sort of a plane of demigods of teaching. Um, I've never done badly, but I started to get scores like 6.3 and 6.4 after we blended in the materials that we had created for the MOOC. This is a big eye-opener if you're a professor. Usually bigger courses do not reward you with higher ratings. 
right? So we're accommodating more students. The students are reacting more positively to the material. And because of the automation in how we can train them, they're actually able to do useful projects that real nonprofit customers are finding value in. So that's a very powerful com combination. Um, and as I said, a number of instructors who took our MOOC online have become so enthusiastic, they're now taking this approach in their classrooms at eight or 10 different universities in the US, one in China, and soon a whole bunch in India. So um, let me kind of leave you with a view of MOOCs that maybe you don't read about in the paper. These are sort of the top three things that I used to get asked by reporters. Uh, will Berkeley fire all its faculty and TAs because now they can save money by putting students in front of a computer? No, on the contrary, we can use them in conjunction with what we do to improve the quality of the course in ways that we couldn't do before. Will universities replace traditional instruction with MOOCs? Absolutely not. What we're doing is we're giving our instructors better leverage of their time. They have limited face time they can spend with students as it is, so they should be able to put that time to a higher leverage use. And that's in fact what we see happening in my course and many others. And does this distract faculty from improving our courses? No, on the contrary, we can now do the same kind of analysis of questions, for example, that the SAT and GRE exams do. Statistical analysis techniques that have been well understood since the 40s, but are dependent on having a large data set on which you can observe how students interact with your material. Classroom instructors historically have not had that opportunity, and now we have it. So this is how you can think about it. We have research that we can do on campus to understand what works and what doesn't in this format. We try those techniques in Berkeley courses. If they work well, we deploy them so that thousands of students around the world can take them. And when we analyze that much larger data set, the benefits of the analysis are put back into the campus course and it benefits the Berkeley students. This is the MOOC story that is actually the exciting one. It's the path that Berkeley has been pursuing from day one when everybody was saying this is a way to make money, which believe me, it is not. Um, and it's the reason that uh, the more we can do this, I think the better it will be for our faculty and for our students. So I'm going to stop there and pass the mic along, but uh, take one of the sad Obama postcards if you want to learn more or sign up for the course. And I'm going to be going to the computer science event in Valley Life Sciences after this. So if you're majoring in CS, come talk to me. <laughs> Thanks. Thank you. Also, I asked you to keep some numbers in mind earlier. So um, Armando, as recently as last month when we checked, Berkeley had 500,000 enrollments in MOOCs, including Armando's. So. Ooh. Not enrollments, not completers. So you heard Armando mention how many students you know, drop off after assignments, et cetera, but 500,000 enrollments, which is pretty astounding. Clancy. Hi, uh, my name is Clancy Slack. I'm in the chemistry department here, and I guess I'm just, just going to share my story today about developing a hybrid classroom, uh, which is also a blended classroom, um, as Diana mentioned earlier. So in introductory chemistry is often thought of as one of those courses that lends itself really well to online education. Uh, although there is a lab component, which is not lend itself very well to online, the lecture component is very straightforward and fact-based and not necessarily needing a lot of discussion. And so it's one of the first courses that most schools will adopt as an online program. Uh, here at Berkeley, we thought we would try and take this online component and kind of blend it with our classroom. And so what we did is we gave students a choice. Uh, so first, you should probably understand a little bit about how Chem 1A works here at Berkeley. Uh, we tried the hybrid classroom in the spring, which typically has between 800 and 1,000 students, um, taught in three lectures a week with a discussion section where they can come ask questions to a TA, such as myself. And so what we decided to do was take some really high quality uh, production materials for an online chem course, W1A, which is offered through UC Berkeley Extension um, and also over the summer here at Berkeley, and blend that in so students had the option of coming to the live action you know, classroom with demos and a lecturer standing with a PowerPoint, or they could choose to use these shortened 10 minute video clips that kind of break down the lessons into individual parts and watch them in their own time. Uh, and so we employed this traditional classroom versus flipped classroom, where instead of discussion sections, uh, traditional flipped classroom is where lectures are all online, and students have the option to come to these kind of mini workshops every week where they do their homework with a TA or the professor. And so things that were traditionally in the classroom are now at home, and things that were traditionally done at home are now in the classroom. And we employed this option. And it, it worked out really well for chemistry, which is a lot of problem solving and math. And it's hard when students come in, these are first year students here at Cal, 
and you don't really know their chemistry background, their math background, and so when they sit through a lecture and then you send them home with problems, you don't know how they're working through these problems, what they're struggling with, and so the flipped classroom idea really let us kind of make the most of our one-on-one -on -one time with students. So instead of you know, having to try and figure out what they don't know, we actually watch them working in small groups, figure out what they struggle with, and we can tailor the materials online to what students need. Uh, this worked really well for us. At the beginning of the semester, students were very hesitant to take advantage of the online resources. We had about 700 students regularly showing up for lecture for the first three weeks, and then after the first midterm, it dropped down to about 450 to 500. Uh, when students realized that they could just sit in bed and watch the lectures and not have to drag themselves to an 8 a.m. class anymore and still learn the same material. Uh, the hardest part about putting together these hybrid classrooms is actually dealing with technology and figuring out which technology benefits your students and which technology just kind of makes it more confusing for them. One of the best pieces that we found was this inclusion of a new dynamic textbook. So we took the traditional textbooks, which are far too expensive, uh, especially for students who are trying to take lots of different science courses, and we converted it to a digital interactive form. And so now students' textbooks not only had the traditional text that you would see if you picked up a book at your local bookstore, but they had interactive um, videos in them so they could read about a topic and then watch a short video or a demonstration of how that topic is actually uh, used in the real world. They could also interact with the graphs and figures, so that's a very important concept in science is that we like to show graphs to demonstrate physical characteristics of things. And now students can play with the scale of those graphs. They can say, if I change this parameter, how would this graph change? And I think that that is a really important tool for getting a physical understanding of the concepts we teach in chemistry and other science courses. But also, these books allowed us to input questions. So as a student is reading, there might be a little question mark in the middle of the paragraph, and it pops up, and it asks the student a short, very poignant question about, did you understand the last few sentences that you read? Were you really paying attention, or are you just kind of skimming along because you know you're supposed to read this? And a lot of students had some really positive feedback about that. Um, about being able to bring their book with them. You can bring it up on your cell phone, your iPad, your laptop. You know, they weren't constricted to carrying around a 10-pound chemistry book all the time. Uh, so that was probably my favorite piece of, that we integrated into the course. It's also fully editable. So at any time, I can go into chapter seven and write my own paragraph and say, hey guys, I know in lecture we covered this, but I wanted to add this extra section just so you can get a better understanding of the concept. And it would give a little star next to it and say, added by T.A. Clancy and students would know to pay attention to that um, whenever they open their book. Uh, other than that, we also used Piazza for an online forum, and this had both some drawbacks and some uh, benefits to it. We were looking for a forum that allowed students to interact and debate kind of concepts from lecture, like they would in the way we teach Chem 1A here at Berkeley is using chem quizzes, which are questions that come up in certain points during the lecture and students are answer privately using an eye clicker, another piece of classroom technology that we've adopted wholeheartedly in the chemistry department. And then they see the distribution of answers and they have to discuss in small groups and converge on a single answer. And so that is one of the things that is most favorably thought of of students when they look back at Chem 1A after their experience. They love the idea that they get to try on their own and then they have to convince their peers or be convinced by their peers uh, that they understand the concept. So we had a hard time integrating that into this online course. I think that's the biggest struggle. How do we emulate this in-person conversation experience through a computer without having students required to be online at certain times during the day? And that is something we're still working on as we further develop this course. Uh, but the forum worked relatively well. I wouldn't say it was a huge success. Uh, students would post their answers, like what they thought the concept was, what they thought the answer to the question was, and their reasoning, and then students could respond. And at the end of kind of some debate, one of the TAs would step in and say, student A is on the right track. I think you should follow their logic a little bit farther. Uh, going forward, we're actually following that kind of path that Armando just described. We're turning this hybrid Chem 1A course into a MOOC right now and we are combining these materials from the online version of class along with the dynamic book so that students can have that resource as well and trying to find a way to put it, package it all together and put it out there on edX so that other schools can look at it and just people anywhere in the world can have a basic understanding of chemistry.
Um, as far as the opportunities, I think that our students really loved the freedom that this course enabled them. They really liked breaking down the lectures into 10 minute segments. Chemistry can be a little bit daunting for a lot of first year students. It is one of the most popular classes on campus, so most, more students take chemistry than any other introductory course uh, because it is a prerequisite for so many different majors. Uh, and so they really like being able to do it in short bursts instead of having to sit and look at three different concepts all in one hour period. The drawbacks were the accountability is a little bit lost for students. Chemistry is hard and they can get discouraged and if they're not in a classroom or directly dealing with someone, sometimes that could be a problem and that was one of the things that we're also working on. So if I could interject for just a moment, I actually hadn't met Clancy until like now, now. <laughs> whatever, but when we started. But let me just say two things. Uh, first of all, bravo that, that you guys have done all this stuff. And uh, I didn't mention this, but I also, because I'm a software guy and I love teaching, I actually am also doing research on how to improve the interactive facilities and online courses. And we have something that does what you want. We have, because we, we also use this discuss the question in class and converge on an answer. Mm -hmm. We also wanted to replicate that in a MOOC and we now have a prototype that does that. So we should talk. Oh yeah. Because that would we would be love great. for you guys to use it. <laughs> and the other thing is as far as popular undergraduate entry level classes, I think the introductory computer science class just took over you guys. The <laughs> yeah. So uh, you know, game on with that. Game but on. Anyway. Okay. We'll see. We'll see. Sorry. We'll see. Hi, I'm Pradeep. Chibber, I'm the director of the Institute of International Studies and I teach in the political science department. Susan and I have been teaching the same course uh, for multiple years now and we've taught it in three different formats. We've taught it in an online format, which we're still doing. We've taught it as a flip class and we've also taught it as a hybrid version, which we're doing this term. But let me talk about this online education from the somewhat Luddite corner, right? And the Luddite corner is the social sciences. And the social sciences, from my perspective, face a problem that's unique to the social sciences and maybe less to the humanities, but maybe not. That an upper division social science class, like the one I teach, what we are trying to focus on is not only to give students knowledge, but also to get them to think creatively and, anal and analytically about a particular part of the world or a particular problem and something that is always changing. In other words, facts are changing on the ground. And as facts change, you need to be able to change your opinions, your attitudes, and how you approach a subject can also change because real world events are sometimes quicker than social science perspectives or social science theories. So for us, the real challenge is how do we continuously update what we are doing? And while we're updating this to get students to actually be able to think creatively and imaginatively and at the same time analytically. To take, for example, the class we teach is the politics of India. Think of American politics. You could teach a civics class just teaching people what the facts are. That's kind of boring and I could see multiple versions of online courses doing that. But the harder question is how do you think analytically about a social science problem like, okay, what is the role of the presidency and how is the presidency, for example, Obama, right? Why is his or her, uh, in case there's a female president, uh, ratings going up and down and other particular factors that are having an impact on what the ratings look like? Why is it that the Congress is in a position it is in? Because we don't have well articulated and well developed theories that are consistent. We have different points of view. And for us in our classes, the trick is to get students to say, okay, here are four different perspectives. Which one do I think works best to explain a particular phenomenon? So when we approached this class, what we discovered is that at Berkeley, not surprisingly, students want to learn at their own pace. They want to develop their own skills. And from our perspective, we want to do this as quickly as possible, as efficiently as possible, but at the same time, we really, really stress the fact that we want students to walk away with deep, creative, and analytic skills at the same time. Now, that's the key for us. So to, to that end, what we've done is we've done a bit of experimentation with the class. So it's not, so I've taught the same class, same materials. Unfortunately, facts change on the ground because facts change, these slides need to be updated all the time. The, con the online content needs to be changed, updated all the time. So we have a course and we've taught it as a standard online course. This is now year three, I think, and it'll continue. And 
It's a standard online course. It's offered through summer sessions. You take the class, you get credit. You know, we have, uh, there, are, there are quizzes, there are assignments. We grade them, we give it back to them. That's one. We've also tried a flip class, which is we, last year I tried this. I lectured for two weeks, gave people an introduction, then said, here are the videos, here's the online material. Read it and come and see me. So I would spend, personally, uh, and the GSIs for the course, would spend about six or eight hours a week speaking to students in small groups. So that was the flip class, which is there was no lecturing, but there was, they were just watching these videos and, and had access to the PowerPoint. The third thing which Susan and I are doing right now is a hybrid live, is what we call a hybrid between a flip and an online course, which is the students have access to all the materials. I meet them once a week where I lecture, so set up what they're going to expect in this week's uh, readings and online materials. We then, second lecture session, we don't lecture, but I have a Q&A with the students. And then we divide the class into small groups. And we divide the class into small groups, and the plan is that Susan would meet half the class, and I would meet the other half over four hours in small groups of six to eight people discussing the material with them. So those are the three ways we've taught the class, online, hybrid, and flip. And I'll let Susan talk about what we've learned or what we haven't learned. <laughs> All right. Um, so let me first say that I think I came to the online education world as a deep skeptic. And um, I thought that I should have some real experience if I was going to be critical. Um, so I came to it from that perspective. Um, and I've learned that there's a lot that you can take away from an online course. And I think there's still a lot. I think doing this has forced me and I think it's forcing other educators to think really hard about what we do provide in the classroom here at Berkeley and it's been really valuable for me personally as I sort of develop my teaching skills and I think it's valuable for the students in an ongoing way because we are thinking harder about um, how we do this teaching thing. So um, what we found, we taught the class these three different ways. Um, broadly speaking in the flip class and in the online class we found that motivated students did well. Unsurprisingly, motivated students always do well, right? Um, we also found that there was a lot, there were, there were a lot of students who got lost. It's, it's not to the degree that in a, in a MOOC you sort of might lose thousands. You know, they, they're still in the course more generally, but they're off track. Um, and in both of those contexts, it was much harder to get them back sort of to the, to the broad general goal of just creative analytical thinking. Um, they were off in the weeds. We could sort of tell we, that they were off in the weeds, but had very few um, ways to get them back on track. Um, we spent a lot of time on both of those classes, um, and we didn't get all that much out of it. Overall competency was fairly low. Um, you know, we had this 10% of the class that was doing really well. The rest of the students, it was actually pretty poor. Um, what we're doing this semester, um, both of us are having a fantastic time teaching this class. <laughs> um, and I guess I'll elaborate for a second on what we do on Fridays because um, it's pretty extensive to give you an idea of the amount of effort that's going in. Um, usually, Pradeep and I are both up at about 6.30 a.m. Uh, grading an assignment and providing individual feedback on an assignment that the students turn in at midnight on Thursday night. Everything is graded and feedback is given by the time they show up at class, which starts, the first section starts at 10. Um, both of us meet these sections in parallel, right? So each of us are in different locations meeting something like five to eight students um, for an hour each. This is after, and they've done all the rest of the materials for the week. Um, and what has come out of it is really good discussion. Um, people are thinking harder about the materials and coming up with better ideas than we've seen in the other contexts. Just graded the midterm. Um, the midterms were really good. Um, far more students are doing, uh, or achieving a higher level of competency than we found in the other classes. Um, they're still having a lot of the flexibility to move through the materials in the way that they want, and yet 
from our perspective, there's a better outcome. Um, we just asked the students on Thursday what they were thinking of the class. <laughs> we said basically we're going to be talking to some people on Saturday and how's it going because we don't have the evaluations <laughs> yet. Um, we know that the flip class, the evaluations were horrible. Uh, we know that the online class, they were quite good. People liked it, I guess. Um, but from our perspective, it still wasn't doing as well as. In fact, the evaluations for the online class, if you believe the <laughs> evaluation scores are actually very good. Yeah. So, but we are not satisfied with the outcome, the right. intellectual outcome, that is. So they like it, but we weren't satisfied. Um, on Thursday, we asked them, how's it going? What do you like? What do you not like? Um, and what we found was that the students are still taking advantage of the same things that the same positive attributes of the online material. So you have one student sitting there saying, well, I love the PowerPoint slides. Next student says, I hate the PowerPoint slides, right? Um, I love the videos. I hate the videos. What we have is these uh, videos that are actually, they're not lectures properly. They are conversations between usually one of us and some other scholar. Um, whenever somebody comes to campus, we sort of bring them in and say, let's talk about your work. Um, so they, they like these materials, and they like being able to sort of choose which materials they access and what order. Um, broadly, the class moves in one direction, right? We're sort of moving through the materials, at least in lecture and in Q&A and discussion. Um, but we aren't actually testing factual material along the way, which means that in many ways they're not accountable um, in the traditional sense. We don't have these quizzes where you say, oh, you got 80% and you got 70, bad, go back, learn again. Um, but they are meeting us face to face um, for an hour, which is, I think, for a lot of them, really intense up front because they are responsible. <laughs> um, but they they are not directly responsible in the traditional quiz sense, um, and it's it seems to be working fairly well the hybrid. Um, so take home take home lesson from the whole thing. Um, I would say that the, at least in our experience in the social sciences, that the flip and online classes provided just a little too much freedom in terms of keeping people moving towards the outcomes that we were wanting. Students liked them, they liked the online class in particular, um, but we weren't achieving the goal that we wanted to achieve. Um, the hybrid, I think, you know, we'd have to actually do some real um, thinking about how to study this, but. I think one of the reasons it's working well is this sort of face-to-face -face accountability. Um, they have to sit there for an hour on Friday and, and be responsible both to their peers and to us. And one of the comments that we got on Thursday was, I really like talking to the other students and hearing what they have to say. Um, and when everybody is moving forward in a, when everybody is moving forward at a high level, those discussions are so much more enjoyable. Um, and I, I know both of us walk out every time and say, hey, that was fun, <laughs> um, which is harder when students aren't living up to that sort of high standard of excellence that we expect here at Berkeley. And we say this is fun even after four hours. Yeah, four hours, no windows in the classroom. It's, it's Friday, everybody sort of wants to be moving on, and yet <laughs> we come out at you know, 2 p.m. It's like, whoo, you know, <laughs> I like what I do, right? Um, so I think that's broadly what we had to say, right? All right. Thank you. So Armando, Clancy, Susan, Preddy, thank you so much. I think one of the things, one of my takeaways, and one of the one of the reasons that I invited the specific um, panel to this session is because Berkeley, as you know, is a is a top-notch research institution, and sometimes we receive criticism that there's not mm. quite as enough emphasis on, on teaching, especially undergraduate teaching. Um, well, we have extraordinary teachers, extraordinarily committed, not only to their research, their scholarship, but uh, also to doing research about the quality of their teaching, um, and in this case, in online ed education. So please join me in thanking uh, this, this incredible group of faculty at, at UC Berkeley. We are kind of out of time, but I'd hate to, I'd hate to leave without um, being able to take a few questions. Is that okay? You know, the governor seems to think that online education is going to save so much money. <laughs> it's all you. telling me, this is not going to be cheaper for the university. It might be better, but it's not going to be cheaper, it seems. You're right. 
<laughs> um, no, I can elaborate a little I'll bit. Stop. Uh, th there was so th there is um, not speaking specifically of the governor, but of general infatuation. As a technologist, I see a lot of hype cycles come and go. And when MOOCs sort of splashed onto the scene in 2012, the MOOC hype cycle began. You know, the hype cycle is everybody's excited about it. It's going to change the world. It's going to cure hunger. Um, and in particular, a lot of people were saying at the time that this is either going to, depending on your perspective, save a lot of money or be a big source of revenue. And I think to Berkeley's great credit, when we had uh, you know, campus leadership level discussions about how Berkeley was going to approach this idea of MOOCs, were we going to get into it, what was our goal going to be, nobody ever believed, ever, that this was going to be a significant revenue source. And there was an early understanding that what it really is is an opportunity to invest in a technology to keep us at the top of our game in terms of teaching. So our, it, it would be great if some of these activities ended up breaking even. But I think you know, when people were looking at, oh, wow, 100,000 students, and you know, so what if only 10,000 of them make it through? They're still learning a lot. If you look at who those 10,000 are, the majority of them already have a bachelor's degree. A third of them already have a master's or better degree. They're generally working full-time professionals who have learned how to learn, who have metacognitive skills, who have learned time management. That's a very different profile from the typical undergraduate student. I mean, our job is to turn them into that in some sense, to, to help them acquire those skills. So I think we, we believed at the time that it was short-sighted to assume that somehow magically, this is good, however good the materials might be, that it would take the place of interaction with their peers and with instructors and with teaching assistants. And I think. You know, look where we are in the hype cycle now. The honeymoon's over. Uh, there's been a lot of unsuccessful experiments, and I think because Berkeley has been cautious in how we approach this, I think we've managed to avoid some of the negative consequences that uh, I think some of our peer institutions, unfortunately, have had to deal with. So you're right. This does not, I don't see this safe. Now, what I do see is if we can really improve our throughput in some of these courses by a factor of four, uh, or if, as in the case of San Jose State, which tried a similar experiment, they were able to increase their pass rates in some of the freshman and sophomore level courses by blending in these materials, well, those are students who are going to get out into the economy quicker and better prepared. Over the long run, that does save money. But you're not going to save it at the front end, right? You're going to save it over the long run. And that's a difficult argument to make when you're, when you're talking to legislators. Hey, governor. <laughs> Good question. So the question is, do I spend more time in the classroom or on campus? Off campus? Off campus? Um, I don't know my, my interpretation of, so I come from a very different institution than Berkeley. And so this was kind of my first foray into the lecture. I jumped right into online and never did the traditional lecture format for this class. Uh, but I think that the focus is still on campus. The focus is still for students to be in class. in class. But because we can take kind of the non-essential in-person components and put them online, we can make better use of that in-class time. <coughs> when I see students during this hybrid course, it's not let me present new material that you've never seen before. It's you've already heard this, you've already read this, you've already tried it yourself, let me work through it with you and see where you're getting stuck. And so you just get such a greater benefit from the FaceTime with a student than you would if they just sat there and took notes while you explained something that they had never heard of before. That's true. Uh, Brian. Um, this is also a question for Clancy. Um, have you been able to measure, and if you have, what have the results been, the like learning gains of the students relative to uh, the traditional Chem 1A course? Mm -hmm. So we haven't been able to compare to the traditional Chem 1A course, although that is something as a department we've discussed. I think mm -hmm. when we first decided to do the hybrid, it was a little last minute, and the requirements for releasing data that we did collect on students are pretty stringent at any university. Uh, but the overall trend is that we had a much better, uh, higher success rate on the exams. Our averages were slightly higher than they had been in the past on the spring term Chem 1A. So the spring term demographic and the fall term demographic are very different. And that's that when we were originally looking at the data, they only had fall term data to compare it to. And so it was kind of not the, what you would expect. Fall term actually tends to do worse because it's first year, first semester students coming into pro possibly their first hard science, you know, that isn't a high school kind of lead you through everything. Uh, but we did see improvement in scores for the spring term group, which is generally either first year or second year students a lot of the time, and mostly 
on the pre-med track or using it as a prereq for some other major. Uh, what we did find, though, is that the interaction with the material was a lot better. We, because we could now track students were doing their homework online, we could see when students were act, like using the book, we could kind of track, you know, what did we have to do to get students to watch the videos, right? We could see how many students had viewed each lecture or each component of the lecture. Uh, and at the beginning of the semester, we weren't really focusing on getting students to interact with it as much. And what we learned is how do we communicate to students that, you know, without saying, Le lecture video 17 is important on the exam. How do we get them to want to go look at them and to want to go interact with the materials? Yeah. By the way, doing this is much harder than just lecturing, <laughs> right? I, I mean, I think an unspoken thing here is that compared to what all of us have been describing that we've been doing in all these different experiments, that is way harder than just getting up and delivering a lecture, yeah, right? Yeah, keeping in mind that lecture comes from a Latin word that means to read, back when <laughs> the lecture was you literally would read stuff out loud to your students because they couldn't afford books. So, you know, it's time for change. <laughs> um, focusing on the accountability and also the outcome measurement, um, you, you kind of touch on this, Clancy, that you build into your program a way to see if people are actually doing it. Like, is there a tracking mechanism where you can see They've, they've at least had the computer on for X amount of time, and then maybe you know some kind of uh, metric at the end where you know if they've absorbed content. And then I guess in terms of um, uh, effectiveness, have any, are you aware of any educators or psychologists who've studied, uh, for example, the, the amount of exposure time that people need to optimal, optimally learn and then to schedule your classes that way. You know, I'm thinking of language learning. You know, it's, it's well documented that if you want to learn a new language, you, you need to learn it on a certain schedule and kind of stick to that and you can't just like cram it all in at the last minute. Um, so I'm just wondering about those two pieces. Are, are you specifically asking Clancy uh, first or? I think I talked quite a bit about the accountability. It's, we do actually, we're using B courses, which is still, it's B courses is, we used to have B space, now we have B courses. It's in a beta version, so it's not um, fully rolled out yet. But you can, and in the online course that we taught, you, you get to see who's doing what, when. You get to see if they've opened the material, how long they, I mean, for instance, we have assignments and we get to see how long they spent on them and things like this. Um, so there's a lot of data, it's hard to, but for me anyway, it's hard to know until I see them using it, um, sort of in the classroom, in, in new ways. Um, so one of the things that we do every week is that we, um, this is unusual in the social sciences, we usually have response papers and things like this. We force them to write a single question every week. Um, and it has to be thoughtful. That's the only sort of <laughs> parameters on it. Um, then we take those questions and we use them in discussion on the Fridays. Um, we actually do this in the online class too. Um, but until I see students responding to new material in effective ways, I don't know what the other, you know, they could look at the lecture slides for an hour, they could look at them for 10 minutes, but I don't know whether that's effective. It might be, the one hour might be effective for some, and the 10 minutes might be effective for some. And I think that's what the online environment allows students to do is if they know how to learn, how they learn, they can maximize their time and their sort of opportunities that way. Yeah, I think if I could raise that a level of abstraction a little bit, yeah. it's the, the kind of the bigger message here, because the, the right answer is what you just said. Different students are gonna have different values for that parameter. Yeah. Um, I think one handicap of the way that most of us have really pretty much been teaching most of our, our you know, adult careers uh, is A, we've had this kind of one size fits all model, right? Yes, we we pick a, a pace at which to deliver lecture, a pace at which to cover things in homework assignments, and we sort of hope that we kind of do a good job getting most of the students into the net at that one pace. Not only do we now have the option to, uh, for at least certain elements of the course, allow students to take it at their own pace, but we, can, we are in a position to collect much more data about how they're actually doing it. So you said, as of now, you have all this data, you're not sure what it's telling you, but yeah. that's okay because that's the kind of problem computer scientists like to have, right? <laughs> the idea that, that campus education can actually become data-driven and that just as you know, hospitals do evidence-based medicine, we can start to actually look at systematically and say, you know, this group of students 
all took a much longer time to learn this concept, or this group of students all made the same kind of conceptual error on this assignment. And historically, it's been difficult for us to extract information like that, and, and now the potential for doing it is there. So I think that the onus is on us, so to speak, in the next few years to actually close that loop and, and fix our classroom materials and our classroom processes using that data. I'm pretty excited about it. It's the reason I started doing education research. I didn't know what all this stuff was like three years ago. <laughs> MOOC meets data science. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. Um, I have to kind of agree with that. In the chemistry course, we almost have a little too much feedback about what our students were doing because we could see how long it took them and when they accessed their homework assignments. We could see every time they answered a question that was built into the de textbook. We could see every time they opened the textbook. Like mm -hmm. all this data, we didn't, it, like none of it counts. There's no like an online attendance course grade. So I think it does give some accountability because they know that we know, you know, that they did the homework this week, that they, but we don't grade them based on getting the questions right or wrong, which I think was nice. We just kind of graded them at some point you opened your book and you tried the questions, um, but not so much on any specific time scale. So they really could, if they wanted to cram and do 10 chapters before the midterm, then that was perfectly fine with us if, they, if that's how they want to learn. Uh, but we definitely did get a lot of data seeing that you know, certain students would be accessing things on a daily basis and certain students would kind of compartmentalize it the way you would in a normal class and like three days a week, they would sit down and they would do their chemistry stuff during what, whatever free time they had. So it is interesting and I would love to find someone who is studying this to maybe see. There, there we are, next one. <laughs> <laughs> you can tell me how to better organize my students. <laughs> Thank you so much for your attention and your engagement. If you think of anything else that you would like to follow up on, um, go to, uh, Chris, what's our website, Berko? Uh, yes, uh, Online.berkeley.edu. Online.berkeley.edu, and you'll be able to find us, and I'm happy to refer you um, if I can't answer your question. So, thanks so much for coming. Thanks for coming.